So Goyal Hav, welcome to Goyal Hav and welcome to this penultimate day um, of the festival. Thank you so much for joining us again. Um, well, I hope it's again. If it's not, welcome for the first time. <laughs> um, with me today, I have Aaron Avasinha. Um, thank you so much for joining me. It's um, a real honour to have you. Um, so Aaron Ava is a translator of over 70 books. He has one of the best well-kept lists on his website of all the books he's translated I've seen. Um, and then he is also a professor of creative writing um, and is um, from Calcutta um, and is calling in today from New Delhi. Um, so thank you so much for joining me, Aaron Ava. Thank you for having me, it's a pleasure. Not at all. So the sort of um, context behind this event, um, it's sort of co-organised with um, Comma Press, um, is that um, they did a keynote in their Manchester and Translation series. Um, and when I watched that keynote, I was like, that is <laughs> everything as a festival. Um, I really want to explore. Um, and in particular, sort of these... Um, the tensions between English as a colonial language and other languages and sort of, um, you know, the sort of this, the place that I have like come up against as sort of organizing events is very much that like, it is much easier to for colonial languages events to happen than it is for um, all of the other languages of the world. Um, so I was wondering if you could start with maybe, um, doing some, oh, there was so much in that talk, but a little bullet point as sort of um, where to begin from, like what's the context um, behind what I'm saying? Well, the context is that, um, you know, those of us who work with books that are not written the first time in English, and I'm using that phrase the first time advisedly as opposed to original, I'll come to that later. Um, those which are not written for the first time in English, and those of us who are trying to translate them and get them published in an English language version, there are some interesting barriers that we face. Uh, one of these, of course, is perhaps the most biggest of them all is the, is the, um, the strategy of gatekeeping that especially the large publishers in the West adopt in order to decide what to publish and what not to publish. And if this gatekeeping had to do really with um, the quality of the book, the quality of the text. And even if that's subjective, that would be fine. That would be perfectly understandable. Um, but much of the time we find that, and some of these of course could be just politeness, but much of the time we find responses that are to the tune of, oh, this is a very good book and an excellent translation, but not for us and not for our readers. And this is when uh, people like us start wondering what publishers mean when they say not for our readers. So there are these arbiters of taste, which I presume all big publishers are because eventually they decide what goes into the hands of readers or not. Um, but they seem to apply this notion for translations that it should not jolt readers too much out of the comfortable um, space that they're in. And that to me and to many others seems a, a complete contradiction in terms. Because if you're talking about a text that's the product of a different culture altogether, and then you expect it to read and be read as though it were created in your own, that would be a very strange thing to do. It might not even be the same book anymore. Uh, and while it might make for ease of reading, the point is, is this really what you want to do with that particular work? Uh, do you want to adapt it to, uh, to, you know, to domesticize it as many translators call it? To, so that the reader feels that this was written in my backyard. So this is a huge point of, of anxiety, particularly because um, for translators like me who work in India, English is also a sort of a natural language for us. It is, while technically it may not be my mother tongue, it is the language that I and many others, about 300 million people in this country maybe, use the most. We use it for almost everything we do. Uh, we particularly have to use it because India is a land of hundreds of languages and at least uh, more than two dozen uh, big ones. So for people from one part of the country to talk to another, you don't have any lingua franca other than English. Really. I mean, there's Hindi, but Hindi is not spoken and understood by a very large part of the country. And especially in today's um, urban environment, when you have uh, immigrants, and that's also a theme that I would like to talk about later. When you have immigrants all over, uh, English becomes the natural language in which we, we talk, we read together, we write, we teach, we study. 
And then, of course, this English is not exactly the English that uh, you in the UK would be using or reading or speaking in. It is not even the English, I would say, that our uh, forefathers used um, 30 years or 50 years ago, because they were much more influenced perhaps by their British education. But since then, our English has become, has been touched by a great deal more, not just Americanization, not just Hollywood, now not just what we watch on Netflix and Amazon, but also adaptations of our own languages and, you know, turning them into English in some very strange ways. So, for example, you know, I will give you a classic Indian English expression. You do one thing. So when you're talking to someone and you're giving them a suggestion, uh, in, instead of saying something like, can I suggest you do this? Someone will very easily say, you do one thing, because that is a very literal translation of what you would say in an Indian language. In, in my language, Bangla, for example, it would be a kach kodo. So literally one work, do. And kodo, the verb ending implies that it's uh, for, meant for uh, you. So um, things like this slip into English all the time. And the translator has to really, really be very aware of what they're going to do with the English version that they're producing. Are they going to produce it in an English that is very comfortably accepted within India, for example? And it's a big country with a big readership and big publishing. But the moment you take that out to a publisher in the West, boom, then everyone's wondering, what is this language you've written it in? <laughs> so, you know, this is a constant source of anxiety. And while at one point, maybe even 10 or 15 years ago, translators from India and I dare say other parts of the of of um, uh, former the former colonies uh, used to think that yes we must conform to the language as it is used in the west now the, the thought that is arising is why why does it have to be so rigid why is not an english that has originated in india and if it's clearly understood if not recognized as being born in your own backward backyard but it's understood why is it not acceptable? Why is, can't it be a good marker for actually the foreignness of the text? Why can't it indicate that this came, this may use similar words, but they're put together differently. The, the patterns are different because they originated from a different cultural space. So this is, um, and that's a very righteous demand, right? Which translators make amongst themselves, you know, when they're three drinks down and they're like, yeah, we don't, don't care for the West. But the truth also is that that is not how it works because you are in a market uh, marketplace and you you therefore have um, people who have been given the responsibility of deciding what's going to work in order to keep the capitalist machine running. And while that may sound uh, sardonic, it is also the machine that provides us the money which can allow us to go on to the next translation. So so we are all in a permanent state of tension as a result of this way. <laughs> Where we understand why it is the way it is, but we don't like it. And yet, I dare say maybe no one likes it, but you know, as a system, that's the way it works. So translators are forever caught in this space and forever trying to assert. I mean, and if you talk specifically about India, then translators in India working into English are forever trying to assert their their right to use the language the way they know it and, and not allow themselves to be bullied into a, a different flavor. Um, and you know, uh, this actually may I go on on this theme a little bit oh, because, this, because, yeah. because this actually struck me as a very interesting. And you know, translators love metaphors, they inevitably use metaphors to explain what they do. But this is an eye point that I came across briefly in a talk that uh, Jhumpa Lahiri gave the other day as part of the Zibalt, the Zibalt lecture, where she mentioned immigration as a metaphor for translation. She didn't really dwell on the theme too much, but it occurred to me that it is actually a brilliant metaphor for translation. Because it is really about what's immigration. I mean, it's people from one culture who are moving into another, hoping to find a home there, right? Which is exactly what a translation is. A book moving from one culture into another, hoping to find a home there, right? Now, if you take that metaphor further, um, how does the immigrant expect to thrive? How is the immigrant going to be accepted? Is the immigrant going to have to become one of the people in the country they're going to before they're accepted? Or can they continue to be who they were and be accepted with that particular identity? And that is at the crux of the question you know, of the translation. Can it be what it was? And can it be admired and read or trashed as the case might be, but 
even if it is trash for what it was rather than what it is trying to be by fitting into a culture which is not very familiar with not very comfortable with and uh, i wondered if if uh, and and who who takes the decision here uh, the immigrant doesn't the immigrant is continuously reacting to cues whatever they get from around them right so the immigrant ends up going into these cultural hovels as it were these these ghettos if not physical ghettos but you know they tend to they suddenly be, so for for example indians who migrate to to america suddenly become very indian when they go there mm-hmm. because they face with this kind of alien setup and they find comfort in one another but that further shuts them off right and then interactions become only business interactions or some mild social interaction now where does the onus lie is it up to them to become more american or is it up to americans or or the british or the dutch or japanese to say let's all be who we are but let's all be accepting of one another and let's accept that diversity is what we want in this world and it makes us better so in the same way if 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 publishers and readers say diversity is what we really want and we want a korean book to be a korean book and not a korean book or transform miraculously into an english book uh then it would work so someone someone has to step up and and take that call i think this tension is now going on and it's it's a very interesting metaphor i found that you know it's it's remarkable in the way it works and then it, there's also the point why do people migrate in the first place they're migrating for better opportunities because they don't they mostly they go because they're not happy where they are and i've just been translating a book by amitav ghosh from english into bangla and he talks about in that novel gun island he talks about migration being one of the outcomes of massive climate change so if you look at it in a sense the need for books to move from one culture to another also has its roots in the fact that there are some global cultural changes that are taking place so if you if you go on want to go into it i suppose it can get quite fascinating um but then uh, Jhumpalaidi also used the metaphor or the or the symbol of echo and narcissus, and he talked about the myth where narcissus falls in love, echo falls in love with narcissus, but echo, as you know, can only echo what she hears from other, only echo the end of it, uh, and so which, in a sense, is that what translation is like? Maybe you're echoing what you hear, and narcissus is uh, does, is not interested in echo's love because narcissus is in love with himself. with his own reflection and if you look at that then here you are you are perfect right it, it's it's so that it, it's almost like someone was thinking up and wickedly creating this story about translation so you have a literature of a country which is so in love with itself eh, i we don't want anybody and the other people are echoing you so then echo is not a translation echo is trying to speak your language mm-hmm. so i as a translator i'm try i'm in love with you the british reader and i'm trying to speak your language to be heard uh, and i'm echoing you but you are so in love with your own literature that you don't have any time for me and it's it's delicious right it's just too good to be true almost yeah <laughs> never, that's perfect i've never heard such a perfect analogy in my whole life so, i know it was too much and then i mean you know uh, it, it, then you realize that art creates patterns when none exist real life is far more chaotic than that and maybe we like art precisely because it creates imposes some order on things that we are unable to understand it is too confusing for us um but the point is where does it take us i mean you know you can, again we can be very righteous and take the moral high ground and say oh but narcissus has no business being in love only with himself and he should uh, you know diversity and he should give echo a chance and find out what echo wants and so on the real question is why doesn't he? right and that i think is the question that we have to ask and find an answer to yeah um so i think the gap when it comes to translations between uh, books that are that originate uh, whose first versions are written in contiguous languages mm-hmm. is far less i mean an english reader is far more likely or english publishers or the marketplace is far more accepting of books translated from french and german and spanish and italian right obviously because the markers are far more recognizable there is not so much quite it's they're not quite so alien it doesn't look like it was written on the moon but uh, when it comes in the, the further and further away you go the weirder it gets the books they get weirder right and then you start wondering should i take this at this value or not so for instance one of the things that we translators always told is that english is a is a 
is pitched low. It's not a high pitched language. But very often the literatures of India are actually quite high pitched. And you begin to see why, because um, we are a country now of 130, uh, one, uh, wait, 130 crore, yeah, uh, 1.3 billion people, right? Imagine trying to be heard. <laughs> Just the simple matter of trying to be heard. There's too much of everything. You know, um, the UK has one business newspaper, right? We have seven. The UK has, um, I mean, you name it, the UK has a reasonable number. US has a reasonable number. We have too much of everything. So as a result, uh, we are all shouting all the time to be heard above the noise. And our literature is also shouting very often to be heard above the noise, you know. And the noise is not just other literature. The noise is light because there's, there's heat and dust and poverty and the battle to survive and um, so on. So... When you take this literature and you try to put it in a language that is very genteel and calm and quiet, then what are you going to do? Are you going to pull it down? Or are you going to say to hell with it, let me write a hysterical piece in English and let's see where it goes. Yeah. And so, you know, this is another classic tension. So the English editor will say, this is great, but it's too much. Can you just bring it down five notches? And so... We are like, no, but if you insist, and since you've given me that 1,000 pound advance, I'm going to do it. So that's how it goes. On the other hand, take what Deborah Smith had to say about her translation of um, of, of the Korean novel with which you won um, the uh, book at. Yes, uh, yes. Um, so um, the vegetarian, she said that she had to crank it up. She said Korean is pitched even lower than English with the result that she actually had to crank it up several notches in order to even get to a point where the British wouldn't feel like they were looking at a cold uh, piece of fish. <laughs> and of course, this led to many howls of protests from in Korea, who said, how dare you take our novel and, and put it up, you know, pitch it so high. So this is a constant game. And sometimes this makes me wonder whether really there is such a thing. I mean, are, are we arriving at this place of, of tension because we are framing the question wrongly? Mm -hmm. We are asking whether this translation represents this novel well enough or not. So who owns a novel? That's my question. Whom does it belong to? Um, I'm reminded of this very beautiful story. You know, uh, Naomi Shihab Nye, the writer, she once in a book, she attributed a poem to, uh, so her husband was traveling in, in the Middle East and he heard a nine-year-old girl reciting a poem. And he came, he made a video and he showed it to her uh, and she used it in her book and she said, and, and the nine-year-old girl said, I wrote it. And she said, you know, this nine-year-old girl wrote this poem. And when the book came out, a number of people immediately rang her and said, what have you done? This is a poem by Mahmoud Darwish. How can you attribute it to a nine-year-old girl? So, so she was obviously very contrite about it. And she immediately got in touch with Mahmoud Darwish, who was alive then, and said, look, I've made this terrible mistake and I will fix it in, in the next edition. And you know what Darwish said? Darwish said something to the effect, all my life I have wanted a nine-year-old girl to claim my poem as hers. And he said, that is all I want. I want her to think it's her poem. And then you realize the poem, she thinks it's hers because she loves it and because she's heard it or read it. And you realize that that is where ownership lies. And if that is who a work of literature or a work of art belongs to, then it belongs to as many people as have read it or have heard it or will read it and hear it. Ownership is no longer centered in, in the novelist's hands. And the novelist or the critics who claim to understand the novelist cannot turn around and say this is not right or this is not accurate or this is not correct it doesn't work like that and then you know i was thinking of the traditions in uh, his, in historically of the landmass that is now called india where you know the one of some of the oldest epics in the world were uh, uh, composed here the mahabharata and the ramayana and these stories circulated through word of mouth over and over again in different dialects and languages and so on and that is how they lived on till the time that they were committed to paper and then to print and so on. Now, obviously, at that point, none of these retailers 
who were actually translators after all, uh, none of them was actually worried about, am I being faithful to the so-called original? They were telling the story they, the way they wanted their readers to hear it. And it belonged to the reader or the listener, and it belonged to them. And every reader and listener added, you know, they added things, they took away things. Many of the parts of these epics that we now consider um, an intrinsic part were actually added on by subsequent retailers. And there is no, officially, there's no, obviously one definitive version for that reason. And you realize that after all, this is what, if the, if the idea of translation is to give a story a fresh life and to take it into, um, you know, into, into the spaces. Sorry, I inadvertently turned off my video. And to, and, and to take it into spaces where it will, it will mean the most to your reader, then surely you're going to do things to it that you need to without necessarily, uh, you know, saying that, okay, I must stick to what I have there. But now by telling you this story, I've actually contradicted myself because now I'm saying now you adapt it for the reader's benefit rather than keeping it the way you thought it was. So it com it's compl <laughs> it gets more complicated. It's the yeah. tension. It's the tension. And the answer to this is really that it's the translator who makes these choices. It is not about one definitive answer, but about knowing what question to ask and then having an answer and then sticking to it, saying, fine, this is the way I'm going to do it. And no two people will necessarily do it the same. And I think that's great. The more people do it, the different ways, the better it is. So, you know, when, when, when this allows you to lose the tyranny of one inviolable text when you're translating, and at the same time, it allows you to tell your readers that I'm bringing to you something that will entertain you and inform you and be prepared for some things that you are not familiar with. So I think that is where, that is where the perfect translation, well, the really good translations occupy that space. Maybe they don't get there by choice, but this is where they end up. And that is why some translated books are so much more like, um, you know, like Bibles, for the lack of a better word, for, for readers who still swear by those books and maybe not so much by uh, other translations, which may be equally competent. Uh, equally, uh, you know, as uh, I mean, there may be virtuoso translations also, but somewhere something, you know, that bit goes away. And maybe that is what great art is. You know, you cannot arrive at it through formula. You arrive at it through some kind of, I mean, look, you know what keeps me awake at night? Um, that notion that if you put a bunch of monkeys at a typewriter, sooner or later, they will uh, type out the works of Shakespeare which means sooner or later, they can also type out English translations of every book that there is. <laughs> it gives them enough time and there, or enough monkeys and enough typewriters and, and they will not be even referring to anything. They will just, will, out of sheer statistical probability, produce the perfect translations of books which the monkeys or the typewriters have never read, have no idea about. <laughs> Oh, that's, I like that reframing of that a lot more. That's a lot more fun than Shakespeare. <laughs> and, and then, well, the one thing it teaches you is not to take yourself too seriously as a translator at all. And then, you know, just the other day, I got a mail from um, an organization which says, we are trying to develop some uh, AI modules for translation and we'd like your help. And I immediately sneered all over the email. And I said, yeah, sure. How can I help you? And they're like, um, so what we want to do is we want you to send us five pages of text and then we will give you an AI translation and you correct it. And then I thought this process in itself is all wrong because you, uh, the, your AI program is not reading the text. It is using my corrections to refine itself, which means that if the same word or phrases occurs in another text, they will translate it the way I translated it in. But Obviously, it, that does not make sense. I'm translating it in a context. But then I thought, yeah, all this is fine, but given the sheer brute power of AI, you know, they will eventually get where humans struggle to get. And the only problem, or which actually then I realized gives me great joy, is that although the perfect translation might be produced, who's going to know? Because it'll mean having to read about a billion or two billion or three billion versions before you say, oh, this is the one. Yeah, 
Yeah. <laughs> and so, so it's it's you know it's like Schrodinger's cat. It may be there, but it's neither dead nor alive. It's not going to work. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> but you know these are these are in a way in a sense some some very sobering thoughts. And um, the point about this domesticization, you know, whether I should take a book written in Bangla and make it sound like it was written in English. Um, see, here's the thing. There, there's some very interesting points there. If you look at it from a cultural or linguistic dimension, then you might say no. Why should it read as though it was written in English? I mean, sure, use English words, use English grammar, but make sure that eventually the reader feels that this text did not originate next door. or down the road um but the question is let's say you are um reading shakespeare mm. okay and now you know many students read this no no tears shakespeare no tears it's called no fear oh yeah, yeah no fear no fear shakespeare no fear. Yeah. no fear shakespeare yeah no fear shakespeare it's like no tears shakespeare yeah no fear shakespeare now um so why are they reading no fear shakespeare because presumably they cannot get out of the text written in the 17th century um what readers got then so in order for them to arrive at the same place it needs the medium the language needs to be different so are we then saying that you know i cannot afford to sit on my high horse and say hey this is a bangla text and it created all these beautiful feelings in me as a bangla reader now you are a reader of the english language i want to create all those same beautiful feelings in you but am i at the same time going to make you feel alienated and distanced from it or am i going to try and reproduce the same range of emotional responses without having you pause and wonder in the way that you will if i choose to do my version apply my theory of translation so you see it gets even more complicated at that point Uh, i mean if you take a simple thing as a joke for example um something that's funny in one language is not translated literally going to be funny in another language at all so you have to, you're already now if you're talking about fidelity you're already saying fidelity lies in the reaction and not in the core so now you you have to construct an equivalent joke that will it have some relationship with that first version of the joke but which will largely make the reader laugh the same whatever that way means and then what complicates it even further is that you don't know what way the reader will laugh you're only trying to make them laugh the way you laughed right but which is here's the, a funny thing a yeah filter. like you are the filter because what makes you laugh is it's exactly yeah. laugh cry we feel angry uh, feel pensive whatever so you know now the question arises if that is so then eventually i am also a gatekeeper of of the responses that i am trying to inculcate in the reader because as a reader these are the responses i felt now i imagine this translator who goes and makes 100 people read the book and then amalgamates all their responses and say okay now i have a bigger set of responses that i myself could not arrive at but i realize people also feel and think all these things when they read this text so i must now produce a text that will enable people to read and feel all these things as well or you could say to hell with it let's not complicate it so much let's just try to do a good job of taking this text into a new language in the most natural organic uh, and beautiful way and allow the greatness of the text to do its job and perhaps this is what will tell a great book apart from a bad good book apart from a mediocre book apart from a bad book that you know does it do does it make readers feel things or does it give them feels as they call it now in uh, even when clothed in a in in a different set of clothes even well dressed in a different set of clothes and you know that is when you realize that a book actually does not exist um as a, an entity outside of the reader's perception it comes into being every time a reader reads it so the if a book has sold a million copies it's actually a million books now even if they're ever so slightly different from each other and of course the less different all the versions are from each other the more it tends towards being uh, you know commercial what's called commercial best sellers where you essentially want everyone to feel the think the same thing and get the same story but a really subtle writer will not be interested in everyone reading the same story because you put yourself into that reading right 
Um, today, I realize that when, when we read Hemingway, for example, whom we fated and, and you know, we were so, um, in, so much in thrall in awe of his writing, and today we could easily read him as toxic ma example of toxic masculinity, right? We didn't note of toxic masculinity. We didn't have it identified for us 20 or 25 years ago. So we were so much in thrill of what we read of this. Now we realize. So the point is, um, so the book has changed entirely. The book has changed entirely. And this is where I want to read something to you. This is from a, a, an English translation of a story by Bohes. It's a very famous story of Pierre Menard. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's about the writing of the man who wrote Don Quixote. Yeah. So I'm just going to read a small part. Um, it is a revelation to compare Menard's Don Quixote with Cervantes's. The latter, for example, wrote, quote, truth whose mother is history, rival of time, depository of deeds, witness of the past, exemplar and advisor to the present, and the future's counselor. Written in the 17th century, written by the lay genius Cervantes, this enumeration is a mere rhetorical praise of history. I'll read that part once more. Truth, whose mother is history, rival of time, depository of deeds, witness of the past, exemplar and advisor to the present and the future's counselor, unquote. Menard, on the other hand, writes, quote, truth, whose mother is history, rival of time, depository of deeds, witness of the past, exemplar and advisor to the present and the future's counselor. Identical words, yeah? Now, this is what Borja says after this. History, the mother of truth. The idea is astounding. Menard, a contemporary of William James, does not define history as an inquiry into reality, but as its origin. Historical truth for him is not what has happened, it is what we judge to have happened. The final phrases, exemplar and advisor to the present and the future's counselor, are brazenly pragmatic. And the same uh, sentence fragment he described in Cervantes' version as, this enumeration is a mere rhetorical praise of history. <laughs> So what you read is so informed by your time and space and personality and your concerns. I'm sure any book we've read during the pandemic will not read the same way, will not have read the same way when we read it earlier. Does it become a different book? Yes. Um, so then where, where does, so that brings me to my original point, which is that a book does not exist in, in a set of words. It exists as a very vast possibility of ideas. And those ideas are realized by the reader in a way that is a combination of themselves and the time and space and everything else that they occupy. In them. And the translator does just that. So a second version or a third version of a book, chronologically, it might be the second or a third or a fourth, but actually it is one of infinite versions. And it is merely doing the job of giving to a reader a chance to create their own book by giving them words that they understand. But ultimately, it is the reader who's creating that book. And that, in a, in a very um, exciting way, frees me as a translator. It frees me from you know, what I call the tyranny of translation. It frees me from the cage of having to, here's my text, and I must make sure that this is the text that goes in. I mean, then we no longer think of it in those line, along those lines anymore. Does this mean that I write my own version of the book? No, no translator will do that. They will not. Um, but what they will do is they will do their best for the book. In given, give it all, giving it all that they know, all that they're capable of, all that they're good at. They will do their best for the book to give the reader the, the same options and opportunities and potential to form it in their own way. I think that kind of frees me. Sorry, that was a very long answer to a very short question. <laughs> um, I, um, this everything you've discussed is um a particular area of theory that I find so fascinating because I think that um it ends up in also the conclusion that um no one writing of a book is inferior to another and that um there is no like the translation like it's this removal of prejudice from the fact that something is in translation versus its first writing its original text because that is irrelevant anyway because you've brought so much to the text yourself as a reader that it, that it doesn't matter and in any case you're you're 
reading a different text in time, even if it is ostensibly in the same language, and only ostensibly so. I mean, the words may be in the English language, but even the words have acquired new meanings and lost old ones. Even yeah. a book written 50 years ago will use words in a way that, and yet, I mean, the question that always arises, why don't we translate books from Bangla to Bangla, from Hindi to Hindi, from English to English? And I really feel we should. We should, we should not say that the, la the language is not unchanging. And the best things, that reminds me of like, some versions that I think are translations within a language are like in films, it would be remakes, but not like in a remake, like in a more of a like Jane Austen got remade as Clueless, right? You know, like actually like, and in those ways, then suddenly these do really resonate and those are translations um, in the same way. Of course. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And then, you know, the best translations will make you go and read others. The best movie adaptations will make you go and read the book or other versions or watch other film versions and so on. So I think that's the beauty of it. That's that's the brilliance of it. And that's the enormous potential and opportunity that that this whole thing allows us. Completely. Um, I'd like to, um, sort of the next area that I am very interested in is, um, you've spoken about India's linguistic history and how in particular, Bangladesh is one of the only is the only country in the world actually named after the language um, that it's that is there um, and that the also um, you know the partition of India into India and Pakistan had these huge linguistic uh, implications and divisions and then sort of I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that and then actually about um, so I so I think that um, a lot of work in India literature is published in English and sort of is that um do you wish that there was much more translation um in all of the other languages in India like what sort of is you know and also is there any tension there with this idea of um literature being defined as written literature that looks like the Western tradition as opposed to any other tradition of what literature might be or we might want to define it as um, oral literature being the one that springs to mind. Yeah, so I think in, in India in a sense is the perfect laboratory for exploring and experimenting with all these questions. Um, it, it's the only country in the world, only a political entity in the world with so many languages. No other country has such an incredible diversity of languages. And language is a hugely political uh, thing in India. Uh, it always has been in many ways. Mm, for one thing, it became the basis on which new states or provinces were carved out because people who spoke the same language did not want the artificial imposition of, um, of a regional identity. They wanted it to be mapped to their language. So in a sense, what happened in Bangladesh was also what happened in India. Uh, in different provinces where people didn't say we want our own country, but they said that we want our own state based on our own language. So states were rearranged on linguistic terms at one point. And um, because states were rearranged, that tension that start that so the little fires that started then have they've been simmering. Thing. They've never quite gone out with the result that now much of chauvinism has to do with language, linguistic chauvinism. And, and you know, there are um, conflicts that spill over into other areas of cooperation, like sharing of river water or sharing of natural resources. But the lines all inevitably are drawn on the basis of language. So that's always a problem. And yet, because we are a fast industrializing society, there's obviously a tremendous amount of migration in urban areas in particular, which means people with different... Uh, mother tongues go to other parts of the country. And so these are also creating these, these sub-nationalism, forms of sub-nationalism with um, some political parties insisting on jobs being reserved only for speakers of the so-called native language. So, you know, it's becoming, I mean, it, imagine if London said that, or in, said in Wales, jobs only for those who speak Welsh or something like that. So. These things obviously don't sit well, but you also realize that these things are inevitable in, a, in an artificially constructed political entity. This is what India is. There was no organic way for India to be formed. It was the British who actually came and created, um, in a sense, a single entity called India. And it wasn't until 1947 that there were all these independent states run by local kings, which had to um, decide which country to join, India or Pakistan. So language became a very big thing. 
um, Pakistan, uh, when it formed, realized that one of the, because of the tremendous similarity between the people of those who were going to be Pakistanis and those who were going to be Indians or remain Indians, uh, they were similar in every possible way. They were similar in culture, in speech, in food, in thinking, in climate, in, in natural resources. So in order to create an artificial divide, they had to use language as one of the means. And they decided to pick on Urdu. Now, as a result, what has happened today is that completely incorrectly, Hindu chauvinists in India associate Urdu as with an Islamic, being an Islamic language. Now, the funniest thing is that both Urdu and Hindi, as we know it today, are actually artificial constructions. Uh, Urdu and Hindi were, were one language at one point. It was, you could call it Hindustani, but many writers, such as the great Prem Chand, actually wrote in a language which did not see Urdu as being distinct from Hindi. Um, there was Persian and there was Arabic, but all, like every language, um, you know, large chunks were uh, amalgamated from other languages. The, my mother tongue, Bangla, for example, um, uses words not only from English, but from all, from the languages of all the colonial powers that have some time or the other come and lived uh, or come and um, try to run parts of Bengal. So, for example, uh, many Bengali words actually are of Portuguese origin because the Portuguese played a quite a big role in the lives of Bengalis in the 18th, 17th century. So, and we don't even know it. We are not even aware of it. Our diet, for example, the fact that, so, you know, there's this joke that um, biryani, are you familiar with biryani? Right. So, there's a bit fight over biryani in India. Well, like languages, there are many versions of biryani. And we in Bengal insist that our biryani is the best. Mm -hmm. And one of the key points of our biryani is that it has a potato in it. Now, the funny thing is that the potato is not native to Bengal or to India. The Portuguese brought the potato into India. And yet we are like, yeah, yeah Bengali, we can't live without potatoes. So I think it's beautiful the way it works, right? I mean, we are all globalists without being aware of it, which is why these barriers, these borders and barriers, we put up our fantasies. They're fantasies born out of our need to create some kind of distinctive uh, identity where none is when none is needed or it did not even exist in the first place. So all these languages have created this, you know, this great uh, sort of um, conflict zone and um, Hindi, which is spoken. So Hindi was uh, crafted by the British. They came and took a language called Khariboli. So when they were moving their capital from Calcutta to Delhi in 1911, they realized that they were going to move into a part of the country where Bengali was and, and English were not uh, understood or read or written by anyone and they had loads of government documentation to prepare right to lay down all the rules and regulations and policies and so on that and people had to understand them so what language would they use so they had to use they you know there were these various flavors of what is called hindi today that was spoken across north india and obviously as uh, i mentioned this before my colleague the professor dita kotari she said that if you travel from the extreme east of india to the extreme west for example you will never know when one language changes into another. Mm -hmm. Although we have these, we think that in Assam, they speak Assamese, in Bengal, we speak Bengali, in Bihar, we speak Hindi. But if you're actually traveling on the ground, they're just mutating slowly. You know, you're acquiring certain changes in sound and phrases and words till suddenly you realize that, oh, you moved out of that area altogether and now you're speaking a completely, using a completely different set of words. But even as you do that, the next lot, you know, their words have started coming in. So these languages don't actually, it was only writing and publishing and printing that created structures for these languages. Otherwise, people on the ground couldn't care less. They spoke whatever would make them under, you know, the guy next door understand them. So the British took a, a version called Khari Boli and they said, this will be official Hindi. And so they turned, they turned it into the official Hindi that is now considered, um, uh, that oddly enough still resides only in government documents. Nobody actually uses it. <laughs> it is like the average, you know, <laughs> the average of a large set of numbers may not represent any of the numbers at all, but somewhere it seems to represent all of them. So the Hindi you hear in, uh, in uh, Bollywood films, for example, is nothing like this Hindi. The Hindi you will hear in, 
in hindi speaking states that are close to bengal is far closer to bangla than it is to this hindi and the hindi you will hear in um, in the, on the western side is far closer to punjabi which is spoken in pakistan by the way <laughs> than it is to anything else as well so it's beautiful the way language works and language also makes a mockery of borders yes unless uh, unless it is officially imposed you know we hereby decree that this is the language of this land so that is something that many indian governments have been trying to do with the hindi with hindi and obviously there's been tremendous pushback because language is seen as a strong marker of identity so this is something that has raised all kinds of uh, anxieties and tensions and worries within the country this notion of imposition and governments one after the other keep trying uh, insidiously to push their language agenda and then they step back and it goes on and on and the funny thing is we translators who actually want texts to move between languages freely and smoothly are not able to do it because in a sense people are so now stuck in islands of their own language that we can't even find translators from a tamil to a to a gujarati a malayalam to a to a bangla and so on we you know 50 years ago people actually knew more than one language of india today that is no longer the case so what has happened is that we have started using english which as i explained is lingua franca as as a sort of bridge language to try and take texts and content and everything across from one local language to another it goes via english that is the uh, that is the irony of it mm -hmm. and so for all the all the pushback against english as a colonial as the language of the colonizers india perhaps more than any other colonized country in the world i dare say has made english its own in 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 a hundred different ways and a thousand different ways in fact so so much so that you know this english is now very much an indian language and i dare say in the course of this conversation your ears must have picked up things that i've been saying or the way that i've been pronouncing words which you would not hear uh, you know where you are or nearby right so unlike in the past today people who speak in english are no longer worried about uh, sounding like an english person now they're happy to use it and speak it the way they want to so english is 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 mutating very quickly in india and it's getting to a point where it's going to become um, you know it's almost like the way it's used in the caribbean for example or in parts of africa right i was going to make this point earlier like what are you describing i wasn't sure but what you're describing sounds to me like creoles like it sounds like that we've had a few creole series talks and it sounds like a very similar thing and yeah it's fantastic because like yeah, i can yeah. read a book in jamaican creole or trinidadian creole and understand it like and like why can't i do the same with indian english like that would be the same thing like i could you just sort of switch on that bit of your brain once you get into it yeah. you're there and you understand it exactly and if we if we keep applying different rules to to say this is good and this is not then obviously it's not going to go very far but if you take the language for what it is and mind you this is perfectly okay when it comes to one of the non english languages of india when people experiment with those languages or use their further localized versions or dialects nobody complains and they in fact then at that point oh this is so authentic this is so rooted in in the way people speak this is perfect this is the way literature should go and we as readers must make the effort to understand and appreciate and not everything has to be understood you can also enjoy the music and the tonality and the sounds blah blah so Uh, when you go to a new place to travel you have to pick up the language it's not their job to uh, speak like you it's your job to understand what's going on so all beautiful but the moment it's english it's like no you can't do this you must write a particular way but you know the thing is that uh, artificial imposition of these structures and rules can only last so long maybe if they're in the hands of people with real power they can go on a little longer but not very long so sooner or later it's beginning to crumble and sooner or later it will crumble more and i dare say in a generation from now india will have a, a version a flavor of english which maybe uh, english speakers in the west may not be able to make complete sense of anymore at which point translators will be truly relieved of their responsibilities of trying to sound like the british or americans because they cannot they will no longer be able to do it at all so yeah in a in a sense we are also caught in that in that space you know where we are transitioning from one to the other because our education was in the queen's english 
yeah. uh, was in Queens English, and we are. It's very hard to shake off those roots, you know. Mm-hmm. You instinctively uh, adopt those. I mean, it's taken a, me, for example, even today. I don't think in conversation I can tell someone I'll call because of this um, school education at a missionary school uh, where we were taught by Catholic priests from. Um, it was, my school was founded by an Italian, um, not Italian, sorry, by a name for an Italian priest named Don Bosco. It was so funny because, uh, so we grew up with the word Don uh, as as uh, as a marker of respect. Yeah. <laughs> and it took us some time. And, and, and Don Colleone, we realized what Don means, oh dear, that's not what it means. <laughs> that is funny. So when you were saying... <laughs> What um what would you go to say instead of I'll, I'll call you like what's what oh, like right sorry yeah that? so I I still tend to say I'll ring you yeah yeah and, yeah and then I realized that okay maybe maybe you know one has to accept the fact that everyone around me now says let me check my schedule and no one says schedule anymore and I I really have to stop getting hot under the collar every time I hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's but a, then I realized that I'm I'm being as as tight uh, as tight as as <laughs> all the people I am criticizing. So yeah, it's drilled into you as children, though. It's like this is the right way to do something, and that's why people as adults can be like, you know, interested in like correcting other people's grammar and things like that without the sort of acknowledgement that like the the grammar they'd learn was itself the product of however people spoke and wrote and changed and like that actually that's just what you're witnessing going on um exactly yeah yeah so i teach a, i teach an introduction to creative writing course where people um, write stories and poems and so on for the first time and because many students are well for the first time in an adult sense and because many students are not necessarily, they've not been to schools where, where you know, English is taught uh, with, with a great degree of brilliance, they, they're very scared when they start. And I just tell them, just write, forget about grammar, just use the words that you know, and let me hear your language in English. That's fine. Uh, English words are fine, but I want to hear your language and the passion and the energy you bring to it. And I think this is how language evolves. I mean, people make a language, language doesn't make a people. So. And translation very much uh, needs to go the same way. The people who translate and the people who read need to make the language collectively in which they will read texts that may have first been written in a different combination of words. And as Walter Benjamin says, if the if the text itself resides somewhere in the ionosphere outside of the outside of being a prisoner of a particular language, in some kind of abstraction, and then you just pull it down to earth and dress it in a different way each time, then that's great, mm-hmm. right? And you are, you are, in fact, the thing is that um, if let's say you're translating a book that was written 20 years ago or 30 years ago, why are you doing it? You're doing it to bring it to a new set of readers. And you, you really need to bring it to a new set of readers in a new way. Mm-hmm. There's no point in saying just, read it exactly the way it was, read it for what it was. Why should the reader bother? I mean, except for the scholar, why are they interested in reading a text for what it meant 30 years ago? I know, I want to know what it means to me now, why, why I like it now, why, what I value about it now. What I see in it is wrong and flawed and, and terrible. And yet I understand how powerful it is. And I can, I can, I'm full of awe at the fact that something so wrong could have been so brilliant. I mean, it's like reading Lolita now or yeah. reading Lolita for the past. And yet there were generations of readers who couldn't stop uh, praising Lolita, right, for what it was. And um, yet you see now that it was something then, but that something now is different now. And I need to read it in, in on my terms. I think Lolita, Nabokov and Hemingway are two incredibly good examples of this because I think Lolita and particularly The Old Man and the Sea are written very, very well. Like both of those, the thing I get from both is the quality of the writing. Um, And I think that like you can still have that conversation whilst having the conversation about um, actually like what were these two men like and what, what what are these books like what are they actually saying um yeah 
even even Conrad for that matter. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, if you, if you look at it, Conrad wasn't trying to show his people in his book the way they saw themselves. He was just trying to adopt a different way of looking at them. But mm-hmm. that's nowadays that's not the thinking. But you also realize that thinking changes. I mean, Conrad was a product of his times and maybe a little ahead of his times. And what we are thinking today might be considered retrograde twenty years from now. And so it should be. Yeah. Yeah, otherwise, how is how is how are humans going to make more progress? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's where, like, you know, it's why young people's language is always the interesting place that language is changing. Um, you know, because you see it in, like, for example, pronouns and like people's comfortability with using like trans inclusive language is so much better. The younger you are, basically, <laughs> the younger you are, the less it it jars yeah. to use them. Yeah. And so that's then, right. Yeah. There's no unlearning. They're just doing it naturally. It's it's their natural form. In fact, this brings up a very interesting point. Bengali, you know, uh, in Bangla, the pronoun has no gender. Mm. So it, this is something that many writers have taken advantage of mm. in order to write long uh, passages. And Tagore, particularly in his poetry, kept it beautifully ambiguous. You did you did not you could not pin down the uh, agenda, and you realize that language can can do so much in order to achieve this and then you say let's just take it into the I mean, new language and and just give it to them you know give a language something that it doesn't have in order to make things better instead of trying to stick within its limitations and it took such a long time for they to be uh, even halfway considered as an alternative even today so many people write he or she mm-hmm. not even and, and they're very blissfully unaware of the fact that um, even if you are halfway well intentioned with he or she, you're leaving out a whole bunch of people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I uh, couldn't agree more. I guess um sort of um to sort of wrap things up, um, I want to draw the like, I feel like there's been like two halves of the talk, the one on trans like the half on translation, the half on language. And I feel like there are so many parallels between what you've said actually in both. Um I was wondering if we could like draw them together. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's that that's a good challenge. Um, so you know that's the thing. Um, is is a work is a work of literature is a text so closely bound to a language that if you try to remove the language from it, it will not be what it was anymore. Will it change completely? Will it collapse? Will it fail? because a language can a particular language can do some things and because it can do some things and you're writing in that language you like the example i just gave where you, you're able to create an entire passage or passages with gender ambiguity because the language allows you to do it and if you were to take the the text out of that language are you going to be able to achieve the same effect um, with as much ease so even today, if you use they in English, for example, uh, the reader is still, it's its still not as smoothly internalized, right, as he or she is. Whereas in Bangla, she, which is the equivalent of, um, the gen- which is the genderless pronoun, no one bats an eyelid. Mm-hmm. And uh, in fact, it does some very interesting things with Tagore's songs, where uh, songs that are perceived as love songs are then sung both by men and women, and in your head, you're thinking, and because it's a heteronormative world, you're thinking that the man is addressing a woman and the woman is addressing a man. But of course, the ideal thing would be when you realize that even that is not necessarily the point. Mm. Um, but um, so there are these things in language. I agree that there are some things in language that lend themselves so much to art uh, of the text that you may actually end up not being able to achieve the same thing. In, when you're using a different language. And I think the, if that is the case, the idea is not to sit and, and you know do this hand-wringing act over it, like many writers do. They are of the opinion that my text cannot be taken into another language because I do all these wonderful things with the language which you cannot do in another. And we may say, okay, maybe we can't, but maybe we can do some very wonderful things when we are retelling this text, which will also be very brilliant and beautiful. So why do we have to be so... Um, tied, why do we have to be so beholden to one text, uh, one language for, for doing what a text can do? But it is a matter of, it is a matter of um, tension. 
to use my most used word today. <laughs> and I don't think there's an easy solution, but I think for translators, the fact that there are no easy solutions are good because it actually spurs them on to achieve something extraordinary, to innovate, to do something that had the easy solutions been available, they would not have bothered to do. And that I think is how great translations are made. When you eventually end up with something because you cannot do something in another language, you eventually end up making something very remarkable and spectacular, which maybe may involve slate of hand, jugglery, magic skills, um, inspiration, and lots of and lots of turning over the pages of dictionaries and thesauruses. Don't let anybody tell you that translation is just a matter of inspiration. I think. Um, uh, I read somewhere in a, in a novel that translation is half poetry and half crossword puzzle. Mm. And I think that sums it up perfectly. It, it, half, of it, half of it is getting the right answer, like in the crossword puzzle. But the other half, of course, is, that, is, is what brings the poetry into it. So to me, that is what I, I try to look for when I'm reading or working on a translation. Do I instinctively feel that, yes, this is true? And yes, this is beautiful. So we go back to Keats, essentially. Beauty is truth, truth, beauty. <laughs> so we can't get rid of these colonizers. That's our problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, it feels like a, a capitalist mindset and a capitalist product of the capitalist system to be precious about your work and to think that your work it can only exist in the one place and that it isn't this shared entity anyway um yeah it's like it is it's belong you know the, like you weren't the product of your shared influences and your shared language you know you <laughs> exactly 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 and you have no idea what your reader is making of your book and that's best. That's the best thing. You've actually done so much in the process. I mean, you've written one tag, one set of words, and you've produced a million books in the process. That's, that's brilliant. <laughs> Why would you want to say, no, there's only one way of reading it, and that's, that's all I want. That is all you need to know on earth. Yeah. That won't do. Not at all, not at all. That's, um, oh, what a perfect way to end it. Um, I can't thank you enough, Aaron Abba. Um, I've so enjoyed my hour and I'm sure that everybody watching will have as well. Um, it's, yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time um, out of what is a really difficult time in India at the moment as well. Um, and thank you. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. I, I had a wonderful day. Not at all. Oh, I can't wait for people to see this. Speak about reading. We've got a, a got a, <laughs> an undisclosed number of viewers who get to then um, watch this and reinterpret it in their own heads and take what they see as important. Yes, I hope so. I hope so. So thank you for watching. Um, if you'd like to see any other talks from our festival, um, please do click down on the links below. Um, we also have a Patreon if you are able to give anything towards the running of the festival. And also I've linked down below Aaron Ava's website and Aaron Ava's books. Um, he's got some books out with some people we've also spoken to like Tilted Axis before. Um, so do have a, have a, have a good browse. Um, and thank you for watching. Thank you, Aaron Ava. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.